Hey guys, I think we got a good one. <laughs> and I'm laughing because I say that all the time at the beginning of the videos, but again, I think I've got a good one. I think you're gonna enjoy it. I think it's gonna bring a lot of clarity to you. Here's the thing, we can talk about what this video is about in two different ways. We could say this video is about the difference between the money market and the loanable funds market, because it is. But another way we could talk about this video is saying, hey, which model should I go to to find out what's going to happen to the interest rate? I.e., when there are things that happen in our world or our economy, okay, say household savings changes, say there's more capital inflows, say business wants to invest more, the deficit changes, the Fed does monetary policy, the price level goes up, those type of things. When those type of things happen, which model should I go to to find out what's happening to the interest rate? Because the interest rate we know in a macroeconomics class is super important. Why is the interest rate so important? Because when the interest rate changes, consumption, investment, and net exports change. And when consumption, investment, and net exports change, AD changes. And when aggregate demand, total spending changes, guess what? We get changes in the price level and real GDP and, yes, hiring. So the interest rate is super important. So let's get to it. Let's start with the money market, okay? So let's first understand the money market and then talk about when we go here to find out what's happening to the interest rate or what's going to happen to the interest rate. Because hey, these are models and we go to models to figure out what's happening to the variables on the model. And the most important variable for these models is the interest rate. So here we go, the money market. Right off the bat, you can see I have drawn the money supply curve vertical. Why is that? Because the thing that is controlling, setting the money supply is the Fed, and the Fed is a public sector actor. And that public sector actor is not influenced by the nominal interest rates. In fact, that public sector actor is setting the money supply, the quantity of money supplied based on what's happening in the business cycle, right? If we are expanding, they might contract it. If we are contracting or going into a recession, they might expand it, okay? So the big thing is a public sector actor controls the money supply. They're not influenced by the nominal interest rate. So we're gonna show the money supply as vertical, meaning perfectly inelastic. Another way to say that, if you haven't taken a micro class yet, is not sensitive at all to the nominal interest rate. They're doing it, again, based on the business cycle, not the nominal interest rate, okay? Now, the money demand curve. There's two components, okay? And you might not always see it this way in your class or your textbook. You might just see it drawn like this or just downward sloping. That's fine, but I like to emphasize there's two components that make up money demand. And what is money demand? It is our preference, okay? Household and businesses' preference to hold liquid assets, which is money. What's our preference to hold money versus other types of assets that we could hold? Well, the number one reason to hold money, that households hold money, is to do basic transactions, to buy goods and services. And that's what this portion is gonna be, okay? Now what I'm saying here is I've got a vertical line right here, and that's for our transaction demand for money. One of the components of money demand is transaction demand for money, our demand for money to do basic transactions. And again, what are we saying by making it vertical? We're saying we're not sensitive to the nominal interest rate for this demand for money. Put it this way. I've never asked my wife, what is the interest rate before paying the rent or even before going to the grocery store? I don't ask what the interest rate is. I'm just gonna pay the rent. I'm just gonna pay the utility bill. I'm just gonna go to the grocery store. I don't look at the interest rate. So there is some component of our demand for money, okay? Our preference to hold liquid assets, money, which is based on our desire to do basic transactions by our basic goods and services. Transaction demand for money, not sensitive to the nominal interest rate, but, there is another component of, that, of money demand, okay? It's called asset demand for money. This is our demand for money above and beyond our demand for money to do basic transactions. Why would we demand more money than we need for basic transactions? Two big reasons, cushion or convenience and speculation, okay? Little cushion, little convenience, and speculative reasons, okay? And that asset demand for money is sensitive to the interest rate. When that interest rate goes up, we're going to hold less because that interest rate represents the cost of holding money. So we're gonna hold less. That interest rate goes down, we'll hold more. Okay, so here's the deal. When do I go to that model to find out what's happening to the interest rate? Number one, if the Fed does something, okay? That's the biggest thing I want you to take away. If the Fed does something, you go here. Now I gotta put in a little asterisk here, okay? What I just said is incredibly true for every year for the last several decades, okay? But it's gonna become less true as time goes on because 
This model is going to be less of the model that we use when the Fed does something because we have changed frameworks. The Fed has gone from what's called a limited reserve framework to an ample reserve framework. Now that's past what I want to do in this video. And as of 2023, AP and IB still want you to know that if we're under a limited reserve framework and there are still some economies, maybe out there still under it, what they would do is if the Fed or the central bank does something, if we do Yes, monetary policy, we go to this model, not this model. We go here and we change the money supply. Basically, if we do expansionary monetary policy and what used to be the way to do expansionary monetary policy, we do open market purchases or lower the discount rate or lower the required reserve ratio. Those are the ways we used to do it. We do expansionary monetary policy, you go here, shift that curve right. And when you shift that curve right, you will see the nominal interest rate go down. Now, of course, if we did contractionary monetary monetary policy, you still focus on that money supply. That's still the central bank or Fed acting right. And so contraction monetary policy would be an open market sale or an increase in the discount rate or an increase in the required reserve ratio. So if I get any of these things presented to me, this is my model and this is the curve I'm shifting. For these, I would shift it to the left. I'd shift it to the left and see the interest rate goes up. Again, the important thing is this is a model to find out what's happening to the interest rate. Expansionary monetary policy, shift MS right. Oh, nominal interest rate going down. Contractionary monetary policy, shift MS lift left. Oh, nominal interest rate going up. Next, this transaction demand for money, super important. What determines this horizontal distance, how much we hold to do basic transaction. Of course, it's not the nominal interest rate. I've already talked about that. So what does determine it? And what determines this horizontal distance right there is the price level, which makes sense, right? The prices of goods and services determine how much money I'm gonna to hold to go buy goods and services. So the price level is a big one. The other thing is national income, or we might say real GDP, okay? So what is our national income? Our national income increases, we'll hold more money to do basic transactions. National income decreases, we'll hold less money to do basic transactions. And if you kind of look at price level real GDP, if you put those together, nominal GDP. So if a problem changes the nominal GDP, you're again changing this. So let me just make this clear. Price level goes up. Oh, I need more money to do basic transactions. This little bar right here, this thing, I grab that thing, pull it off to the right. And then I look at my model and I say, oh, the nominal interest rate went up. Okay. So price level changes. I'm going to shift the money demand. And by the way, that's going to continue even when we you know, fully adopt it from a teaching standpoint, the ample reserve framework. Yes, we won't go here to do uh, monetary policy anymore, but we'll still need this graph for changes in the price level and how they affect the nominal interest rate. And also if the national income goes up again, shift it to the right, interest rates go up. Now there's a couple of other things that I think are a little bit old fashioned, one of them very old fashioned, that you might come across and you need to go here for, okay? That's changes in credit card usage, okay? Credit card usage and changes in ATMs. Now this one is super old fashioned, okay? But let me just go through these really quickly. If credit cards get used more, okay, I don't need it as much, I don't need money as much as I used to, okay? Instead of holding extra money, okay, uh, in case something happens and I need money, I can just have my credit card and just draw on my line of credit. My need for money goes down when my credit card usage goes up. So if credit card usage goes up in an in economy, money demand would actually decrease. Same with ATMs. If there's more ATMs, and again, this is super old fashioned, but if there's more ATMs, oh, I don't need to hold as much money as I used to. I can just easily go to those ATMs because they're you know, just becoming more and more abundant, okay? So more ATMs, shift money demand left. Again, more credit cards being used, I don't need as much money. ATMs are more available, I don't need to hold as much money. Shift that curve to the left. So those are the reasons that we go to this graph. Fed, okay, or monetary policy, or price level changes, national income, credit cards, and ATMs. One last little addendum before I leave it. What you might get is a shift in the AD curve. And then they might say what happens to the interest rate, 
This is your model. Why? Because if you, let's say, increase the AD curve, what's gonna happen? Well, shift AD right in the ASAD model and the price level goes up and real GDP increase. Well, if the price level goes up and real GDP increases, transaction demand for money is going to increase. Shift this curve to the right and the interest rate is going to go up. So just keep that in mind, right? Oh, price level, real GDP. Oh, that means changes in the ASAD model will affect the interest rate. Absolutely. Now, the loanable funds market. The loanable funds market is our market for lending and borrowing, okay? Now, when it comes to this market, our other four macro aggregate actors come into play. What are they? They're households, the rest of the world, businesses, and governments, okay? Now, as far as the supply of loanable funds, the number one supplier of loanable funds is households. That's right, households, and this one takes a little bit of getting used to, are net savers, okay? They are net savers, so household savings, okay? So if we aggregate every household together in net, households actually save more than they borrow, and since they save more than they borrow, they are suppliers of loanable funds. So if a problem changes how much households save, you shift this card, I mean this, <laughs> this curve, okay? What, what might do that? Well, maybe you'll get a problem that says, hey, the government is changing the taxes on interest earnings. Well, when do you earn interest? From savings, right? So if they raise the taxes on interest earnings, well, that's decreasing the return on savings, we'll save less, okay? If they decrease the taxes on interest earnings, we'll save more, okay? So that's when I would go to this model because household savings is changing. Another thing is when the rest of the world is involved. And what we're gonna get with the rest of the world is one of two things, generally speaking. We're just gonna get either capital inflows, that just means money flowing into the US financial markets from abroad. Capital inflows, money flowing into the US financial markets from abroad, or we'll get capital outflows, which is our households taking their savings abroad instead of our own uh, loanable funds market. So here's how it works. If we get capital inflows, the rest of the world's bringing more money into the United States, that's increasing the availability of loanable funds, i.e. the supply of loanable funds. Capital inflows shift it right. If our households start taking their money abroad, that's gonna be a capital outflow, that's money flowing out of the United States, less savings available for our demanders of loanable funds in our loanable funds market, this curve is going to shift to the left, okay? Now, the demand for loanable funds. Number one demander of loanable funds is business, okay? And we're gonna be focused on business confidence. If businesses become more confident, they'll want to do more investment projects, okay? If they become less confident, they'll do less investment projects. So if businesses desire to invest increases, we go that way or this way. Now, when I talk about that, I wanna be very clear. I like to focus on business confidence because yes, the interest rate will change how much we invest, but that causes a movement along the line, right? It's right there, it's the endogenous variable, it's the price, right? It's gonna cause a movement. So what I'm talking about, what's gonna shift this curve to the right is say business confidence going up. Oh, I think the economy's gonna be better. I'm gonna to wanna to invest more at all interest rates. Oh, I think the economy's gonna be worse. I wanna invest less at all interest rates, okay? So business confidence, okay? Businesses desire to invest outside of an interest rate change. Now, what else do we have to do? We need to do the government, okay? Now, this one, I'm gonna talk about that just for a second. Some textbooks associate government borrowing with the supply of loanable funds, and that's fine, and there's a way to do that, and I have some videos talking about that, okay? But for this particular video, I'm just gonna go with the way that we generally go with at Econ Busters, which is this, okay? We think it's the most intuitive thing. The government generally runs deficits, and when they run a deficit, they're spending more than their taxes, right? That's their deficit. Oh, I spent more than my taxes. The difference between those two is their deficit. What do they have to do? They have to borrow, okay? And when you borrow, you are demanding loanable funds straight up, okay? Government is funding their deficit, i.e. borrowing money. That is a demand for loanable funds. They're going to the loanable funds market and demanding money. So deficit increases, shift demand to the right. Deficit decreases, shift demand to the left, all right? So quick recap, all right? If household savings changes, okay, or desire to save by household changes, okay, households wanna save more, save less, whatever, where do we go? This market, loanable funds market, shift that curve. If we get capital inflows or capital outflows, some question that's talking about that, which graph do we go to to find out what's gonna to happen to the interest rate? 
loanable funds market, supply of loanable funds. If businesses become more confident or less confident, wanting to increase their investment at all interest rates or decrease their investment at all interest rates, I go here and shift that curve. Also, and this is a big one, this comes up a lot on AP and IB tests, government deficits change. Which graph do I go to? This one. Government deficits change. I go shift the demand for loanable funds to find out what I ultimately care about, what is happening to the interest rate. I go here again. Why? Fed action, or at least that's how it's been in the past, right? Fed action, and also changes the price level real GDP, which means anything happened in the ASAD model, and then I'm asked what's gonna happen to the interest rate. This is my model to figure that out, because when AS or AD shift, price level and real GDP change, okay? Credit card, credit card usage, ATMs, also money demand. So private, uh, price level, real GDP, credit cards, ATMs, money demand, changing my preference to hold liquid assets. Fed action, money supply every single time. Whew, now. As we close this off, you may be thinking, you ignored something, the nominal interest rate, the real interest rate. Don't you need to talk about the differences and why one model has one and one has the other? Yes, I do, but not in this video. This video is long enough. I hope you stayed with it. I think it's gonna help you a lot. Look for another video that talks about why we put the nominal interest rate there and the real interest rate there. Hope that helped. We'll see you in other videos.